we will run the entire uh, discussion, discussion day and the Q&A session. Sarah? Thank you so much. Hello. Can you hear me? Can you see me? Yes. Yeah? Perfect. Yes. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do, and I hope you can see the chat. If you can't see the chat, you're going to use the bubble button near the top of your screen, and it should open a window. And with that window, I would like you to open this link. It's called a Google Jamboard. And with this Jamboard, so I can see some of you are joining. I don't know who's used this before, who hasn't used this before. That's okay. What I'm going to do in a fireside chat structure, you have just as much knowledge as I do in this arena. So I'm going to have three talkbacks where you're going to teach me and each other what you already know about this movement. So we have these year turns. If you go to the far right here, which is just off my screen that you cannot see, I will share my screen. There we go. If you take this little button and I go test, this is me contributing. I hit save. Your sticky note goes onto the screen, right? So every time I ping your turn, you will have the chance to talk back to me in real time. Does that make sense? If you can use your buttons and, and all your fancy things to just tell me thumbs up, thumbs down, yes, yes. etc. Yes. We got the yes. Perfect. I love it. All right. So I'm going to switch over to the presentation that I hope you can see. I'm going to assume you can see that. I love it. Okay. So thank you, Yana and the University of Limerick. I'm really excited to be here with you, and we're going to talk a little bit about Mad Studies. And I heard, which is really exciting to me, that a number of you just did a whole lesson on Mad Studies. So if I end up being incredibly redundant, I see that as a good thing. Pardon me as I take my coffee. But the first thing I do when I facilitate a seminar is I try to talk to you about my facilitation style, which you may have encountered versions of, and I kind of mash it into one style that I use throughout all my talks. So I call it cozy space. And in cozy space holding, I'm reading the PowerPoint screen. We create mindful facilitation environments collaboratively and on purpose. These are my environmental ethics. And then I'll invite you to share yours with the your turn on the Jamboard, if you remember that. My methodology is fireside chat. That's just a fancy way of saying I invite you to talk to me throughout the seminar. And there's five key things in my facilitation style that I think are important to you in establishing my environment. So that's holding empathy or giving each other the grace of automatic respect and care, facing gray space, treating difficult questions and answers with their best possible intention, this is a hard one for me. This is a bit of a learning journey. I'm sure you'll find that hard moving forward, but if we always treat every difficult question as if it's being asked from a place of love, I find those difficult conversations are easier to engage in. I am allied with the FNIM Ashinanabe Collective um, in Europe. It might be called Indigenous, I'm not sure. Uh, the tribe that I'm with it has a drum circle that I've been invited to, and I take a lot of my listening ethics from this community, and wherever I'm using one of their ethics, I will credit them. I'm open access, low barrier, OA is open access, so I only exist in spaces where low or no engagement barriers are enforced. This is things like pay-to-play journals or high-fee conferences, um, I will always give you a true type transcript, which basically means it's not auto generated. And I will always describe visual content if I choose to use visual content, which is why I'm boring you with reading the slide. Um, and I like co-designed expertise. And a lot of you, especially people in medical humanities will be familiar with this. Our collective chat builds the beginnings of learning pathways you wish to start journeying on. So. I choose not to identify 
as an expert in an area. And I think I choose that because if you're working in equity space, everyone working with you in that collaborative environment is necessarily also an expert, but an expert in a different kaleidoscopic way. And if you unite all of those lenses in the kaleidoscope, you build the expertise that people are looking for, which I think is where, you know, the anthology format comes from. So, last thing I'll say, CW and TW, content warnings, trigger warnings, the communities I align with make use of trigger warnings when there is content that is more appropriate for some learning journeys than others. This is not censorship, it's noting that care work requires us to create space for the pathways that other allies take. So basically going back to the respect and care by default. So I will invite you to contribute content warnings, but today's chat content, um, and I'm trying to predict what you might say in your talk back here. So if I'm a little inaccurate, I'm sorry, but I assume we might touch on mental illness, psychiatry and anti-psychiatry, biomedical rhetoric, disabling discourses and schizophrenia. Um, and I am personally sensitive to institutionalization or asylum discourses, just because I've spent a lot of time in them and I don't love talking about that. That's not to say when I prompt you to think of um, instantiations of madness or mental illness, you're not allowed to say Shutter Island or American Horror Story because I'm aware <laughs> those shows are out there. I don't, I don't ban the existence of asylum. I just prefer not to talk about my LXP or lived experience in that context, and you should know that. So that's all about my ethics moving into this, and now I'm going to ask you for your ethics and content warnings. So if you flip over to the Jamboard, and I'll go with you. Yes, I love that. Thank you for that energy. Sorry, Sarah, we cannot hear you. Oh, no. We have, we have Hello. Hello. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Perfect. All right. So if you flip over to the Jamboard, I love the yes. Thank you so much. If you flip to page two, we have the first your turn. So what you're going to do is you're going to take this sticky note and you're going to tell me any ethics or content warnings that would make you feel less safe in this space. Because the cozy space is not just for me and all of my favorite things. It's also for you and everything that makes you also feel cozy in space with me. So. The exercise, for those of you who can't see or can't access the Jamboard, says your turn, ethics and content warnings. Are there additional ethics or content warnings we should add to our fireside chat? How can we co-design collaborative safety within this digital space? So I'll give you a minute here to add anything you want to add. This was my test sticky. I have institutionalization discourses, uh, namely LXP. I, uh, I did not put myself in a space to deal with that today, unfortunately. Does anyone else, and I will check the first page, none really, but thanks for asking. I can take that to the second page. Boom, there it is. Jamboard link, yes, is in the Teams chat. So I will take this one off of this page. I love the yes. I, I'm just going to put that on the second page just because I love the energy. I'll give you 10 more seconds to contribute anything you'd like to make this space safe for me and you. All right, fabulous. So moving forward, we will use the default cozy space ethic framework. And can you repost, please, for those who have arrived late? Absolutely. This is the Jamboard. If you would like to add more to this, I will check it next time I come back for your turn. But right now, I will operate with the impression that we're OK with my cozy space ethics. And if at any point you become not OK with what's happening, please let me know and we can decompress. So I'm going to start 
with the synchronic community aspect. And because I heard that you guys were already Mad Studies experts, I decided to throw in a little bit of content from my area exam that I'll get to in a bit. But before we do the area exam content, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the backgrounds that are kind of assumed when you want to work in this space. So the slide says synchronic communities as a title, and then there's a byline that says mad studies as an academic endeavor or subject relies on your acquaintance with a few synchronic yet different fields. And how I'm using synchronic yet different is basically to say these are all equity based fields, but they have slightly different concerns and considerations. But these fields also can't really be fully removed from each other. So there's kind of a weaving and an overlapping that's happening between all these movements. And oftentimes, if you have someone in CDS or MAD studies, they will be participating in multiple movements, right? So I have health humanities, critical disability, and social work. And under health humanities, I've put that health hume, which is often confused with med hume. There are some differences here. I'm not going to go into that just because I only have 45 minutes. Uh, but it likes to focus on the art potentiality to bring greater coherence to medical research and innovation with a focus on wellness outcomes that are self-directed or co-designed. So we are not experts. Any detail is welcome. Thank you. Thank you for that welcome. So one of the key differences between health hume and med hume is that health hume is really, really concerned with this co-design framework and uh, pitching things other than cure-based outcomes. And we can go into that if you'd like to. But basically what that means is that you're very, the, the, the patient is very self-directed and has a lot of autonomy in the valence of their care plan. And currently that's not quite the case, at least in Canada. I can't really speak for the UK right now. Critical disability. Most of you are probably familiar with this one. CDS is a more recognizable academic community based in LXP lived experience ethics and represents an activist collective fighting for equity, equity rights of those identifying with a disclosed or undisclosed disability. And something that I thought was really interesting that I'd share with you this morning was that I used to say physical or mental disability. And then I was taught um, by some of my Twitter friends that some people feel very displaced by saying physical or mental disability, particularly because when you have a disabled body mind, it often manifests both ways, right? And if you say invisible disability or mental disability, there's a rhetorical framework working there that we don't intend that kind of delegitimizes at the same time that it legitimizes. So the word that I went with today was disclosed or undisclosed because I feel like you have more autonomy over that. And I'm working on different ways to express what I mean here without discrediting all the rhetoric that happens around not only disclosing disability, but how that disability presents to others, if that makes sense. So that's where disclosed or undisclosed comes from. And then social work, pretty sure everyone's familiar with social work. Social workers are fierce advocates of equity rights for marginalized or oppressed populations, uh, normally facing structural violence. And this field is relevant because it documents a lot of the original mad movement literature, which I'll get into. So if I were <laughs> in two minutes to summarize the entire mad movement, which we all know is a bit of a ridiculous exercise, this is probably how I'd do it. So the first thing I'd say as a rhetoric scholar is, this is all unavoidably narrated by my kaleidoscopic body mind. So everything I say is necessarily through the lens of me refracted into, you know, some version of the truth out in the world. Um, and your choice to trust me on that is appreciated and honored. But I also encourage you to talk to other people <laughs> who are in the mad movement because they may have slightly different answers than I do. So. What I have here is that the MAD movement is an advocacy collective, so it's an activist group, uh, for allies who identify with neurodiversity 
for mental illness. And there's a lot of rhetoric over whether to call it neurodiversity or mental illness, and there are a lot of hard feelings about that. I choose to identify with both, um, but that kind of disclosure uh, discourse is very complicated, and we can talk about that later. This can be physically or mentally embodied, as we've said before, but it's almost always a blurry combination, and we tend to signal that combination ethic with body-mind. That was coined by Margaret Price, American theorist. She did a book called Mad at School. She's brilliant. I love her. Um, disclosure dialectics are very difficult, which overlaps with CDS frameworks, and I already spoke about that a little bit. Most mad theorists credit the kickoff of the actual movement element toward the beginning of the 1970s. If you're a history major, you will know that that's the North American deinstitutionalization imperative, where we threw everybody out of the asylums and said, you're free now, but we gave them no resources. So you're free, but it came at the cost of housing and security and food and having a life, and it created this reactive cycle of homelessness and oppression and violence that was essentially structural because when you give up that security by force and don't set them up with resources in that deinstitutionalization imperative, you've created a whole other problem, which then leads to things like the revolving door framework some of you might be familiar with, where a lot of mental illness um, patients will essentially flip between homelessness, jail, hospital, homelessness, jail, because the framework is just, for the most part, not there. So the next one is some movement activists have strong feelings about anti-psychiatry and iatrogenic medication effects. That basically means there's a lot of research coming out, particularly in coronavirus, which I thought was really interesting, that the longer you stay on, particularly antipsychotics, um, there are degenerative effects over time, and we used to prescribe these medications for life. And now that we're getting all this data that says, oh, like, it works for a certain time, and then it actually starts harming them, and we started burying that data. So then, <laughs> when we started unburying that data, there were a lot of really difficult conversations about um, not only the psychopharmaceutical industry's hold on doctors, which is a whole other topic, but the pharmaceutical industry's imperative to make things that work no matter the long-term effect, because they only measure it study-wise for a certain number of years, and then they feel basically that it doesn't matter after that. And a lot of people have some really hard feelings about that. So particularly, the anti-psychiatry stuff gets really important for people who talk about non-co-designed uh, care plan frameworks. I do a lot of soapboxing about that. We don't have to do that here. Statutes like the ADA or AODA, if you're in Ontario, ADA is the American Disability Act. I have no idea what the UK one is. I'm really sorry. Often apply only very minimally to MAD movement allies. A lot of those statutes are for physical disability. And if you have any disability that's not physical, pretty much good for you, right? So the push for research funding, greater inclusion, and equity in healthcare treatment are central issues for those who work in policy frameworks, and they mobilize typically outside the academy. The last thing you should know as like an absolute introduction is that there's great suspicion and dissonance in the MAD movement toward particularly academics. And the reason for this is because in the 70s and 80s, when this movement started happening, a whole bunch of academics said, this is really interesting, but this is really interesting as something to be studied instead of something to be allied with or to realistically help with. And when all of these subjectivities who had previously been institutionalized and studied were then being studied and kind of reifying that institutionalization gaze and ethic by these academics, it created this big schism between allies on the ground or experiencing or, you know, doing grassroots activism and this secondary framework of people trying to record 
this grass roots activism or these consequences. And I'm sure many of these academics had the best intentions in mind, but the execution was a little bit soulless. So coming into the 2010s and 2020s, this kind of suspicion and dissonance has held on really strongly. So if you're not actively engaged in the actual grassroots element part and organizing and building um, the MAD community, there's, <laughs> there's a lot of dissonance there. And I think that's the most polite way I can say it. So I will do a little bit of the content from my defense because I think it's relevant and I think I made the wrong choice in assuming that no one's ever heard of this. So I'll do a little bit of this. So if I were to define MAD studies from specifically the academic side, I gave you three definitions here. Technically or academically, uh, this is Brenda LaFrancoise's definition. She's a Canadian theorist. She's amazing. A project of inquiry, knowledge production, and political action devoted to the critique and transcendence of psi-centered ways of thinking, feeling, and behaving. So if I were to translate that accessibly, it essentially asks the question, what if psychiatrizing and psychologizing discourses were interrogated by the subjects of these practices? Which is an interesting um, valence shift, because normally the uh, mad people are written about but not quite written with or written for. So ethically, or I put read, why do we do this at all? It investigates the personhood or patient, and I use that word carefully, as a potentiality space for rational and critical evaluation of their own healthcare and socio-political outcomes, while also pointing out ways in which this investigation is prevented from occurring in superstructural context. And I know I said that super academically, this was for a, a defense, obviously, but essentially what I'm saying is I identify as a schizophrenic body mind and MAD studies is really concerned with the question, what if people start stopped writing about me as a person unable to tell my own story, like my wife in the psych ward or most seasons of American Horror Story or pretty much every serial killer in Mindhunter. Like, those are famous schizophrenics. It, it's not great. Um, and you allowed me to identify my own outcome pathways based on the experiences I've had and the research I've done. So a lot of overlap with CDS, obviously. Um, my extremely reductive timeline, which I know is a lot. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. Um, so if you start in the 1970s with the deinstitutionalization, this timeline uh, takes into account absolutely no intersectionality, just for the sake of only doing one movement at a time. So we have the, inter uh, the deinstitutionalization. We get the revolving door. We get the obliteration antipsychotics, so Haldol, where you essentially choose between do I want to be passed out or do I want to hear voices, and those were your only two choices. 1980s, we rebrand all the psychiatric hospitals, we get the PCSX movement, we get the updated DSM-3, that's a landmark uh, for anybody in medical humanities. We get advancement in psychopharmaceuticals. When you get into the 2000s, we get into critical psychiatry, post-psychiatry. Post-psychiatry is really concerned with, I think we've done a lot of harm here, and I want to have a more cooperative model and framework for helping the patients that I'm helping, because I think we've assumed a little bit too much about their ability to help themselves. That's post-psychiatry in five seconds. Uh, we get sanism dialectics. Margaret comes up with body minds. That was great. Patient porn. I'm sure you've read a bunch of it. Medical memoirs. DSM-5 comes out. Mad studies starts to gain some ground right in the beginning of the 2000s. And post-2015, what we're doing now is the mental health crisis. I have a lot of thoughts on that. Uh, the lived experience revolution. That's Tamar Jane's. Gray Space Zines, that's Asylum Magazine, that's Open Minds Magazine, Expertise Frameworks, Co-Design Frameworks, ACT Healthcare, uh, Overprescribing and Iatrogenic Medications, and 
more interest in mad discourse. That's, in a nutshell, extremely reductively, where we've been, where we are in the moment. So, that was a lot of me, right? I'm really sorry, my voice is really annoying. So I'm gonna flip it over to you. Your turn, the PowerPoint slide says, mad movement encounters. So if we flip back to the Jamboard, that's your hint. Where do you encounter images or renderings of mental illness? And then I'm gonna challenge you about what you come up with. How do these images, audio, or lived experiences manifest? Who is telling the story? So if I flip back over to the Jamboard, I'm going to page three. I'm going to start with an example. I'm going to put Shutter Island, the film with Leonardo DiCaprio. And it is, it is narrated by him, but he is an unreliable narrator, just by design. Which I think is interesting. And I think when you start adding your own ideas, you'll start to see a pattern in a narration style specifically. So if I could get you to also create sticky notes with this button right over here and take a crack at where you've seen mental illness represented in public context. And it can be books, music, videos, podcasts, art. I've had someone name like photographers who only photograph people with mental illness. I thought that was really cool. I can't remember their name. Video games. Yes. More recently, WTJ's memoir of a schizophrenic son's life. Was that Beautiful Boy? Which movie is that? Memoir of a schizophrenic son's life. I don't know if I'm familiar with that one. You should give me more information if you're still here. Um, we can do The Collected Schizophrenias is a phenomenal book. There was a book someone just showed me the other day. It's called Girl in Need of a Tourniquet which is apparently about a girl with borderline personality disorder. Silent Hill, great example. That uh, Silent Hill brings up a lot of interesting discourse just because they have what's called a sanity meter, which is a big issue for people in Mad Movement, and that sanity meter was conveyed into other games, like uh, what's it called, Resident Evil had it, and a lot of people have big problems with games using sanity as a metric for ability, because when you look at that rhetorically, it doesn't sound very good, right? Oh my goodness, now we've got Inferno by Catherine Cho, Postpartum Psychosis. I haven't read that one, but now I would like to. Documentaries, yes, plenty. Mental Traveler, I have to read that one. That sounds great. One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, classic example. Girl Interrupted, yes. Silver Linings Playbook. Yes, I have a lot to say about Silver Linings Playbook and this is not the place for it. Uh, a Beautiful Mind, yes. Newspaper reports about the tsunami of mental health problems, right? So the big quote, mental health crisis. And the thing you can ask about the mental health crisis, particularly in Corona, is are we acknowledging it as a problem only now that abled people are also experiencing that problem? Tough question. Can't answer that for you, but you can think about that. Soft White Underbelly YouTube channel. Okay, that's really cool. I would like to see that. Girl Interrupted, yes. In Family Stories, often what's not said is speaking loudest. Yes, very true. The teller of the story are different family members. Very true. Andrew's voice, silenced by bulimia, yes. A lot of people don't count um, eating disorder in mad community, but I choose to. I think there's there's a couple things you could say about that. I will give you 30 more seconds to tell me all your other wonderful encounters with mental illness. I'll tell you one. I am constantly asked at conferences when I reveal I'm schizophrenic, if I'm ever called Harley Quinn. Um, hate that character. Hate what she represents about schizophrenia, but she seems to be kind of the poster girl right now for schizophrenia. The Mind on Fire book, yes, and that one's important because that one was actually self-authored, which is um, a bit different from most of the mental illness discourse. Black Swan, yes, Joker, <laughs> yeah, the Joker, any 
Um, any instantiation of the Joker. Why aren't eating disorders included? Not to say I agree with it, but a lot of people who don't, who, who police that space would argue that some mental illnesses are biologically based, whereas eating disorders are a choice. And I think that choicefulness is really bad rhetoric. I don't agree with that at all, but that's where that argument comes from. The, another video game outlast, yeah. Any video game that has a sanity metric is mad discourse. Um, what's that one? Oh shoot. I don't remember the name, but there was a really famous one where you literally, like, you black out and pass out if you, if you get too insane. And people were upset about that, obviously. Okay, five more seconds. If anyone else wants to add, I love all these ideas. You guys killed it. Two seconds, one second. Okay, so I will show you the ones that people usually come up with. These encounters, Shutter Island, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. That's a really complicated example because it kind of plays within this liminal space of manic pixie dream girlism and total mental illness. Um, we could do whole presentations just on that. People will do like dissociative or madness type art. Mindhunter, pretty much every serial killer in season one was schizophrenic. I don't know why that is, but that's what happened. People will cite brain imaging, biomedical discourses, Asylum magazines up here. They're pretty famous. Everything I Never Told You is a book about a young adult who commits suicide. Collected schizophrenia. Love that book. It's a memoir. Okay, you guys did great with that. So I'm going to move over to the research inequities. And before I slap you with all this, I actually did a better job summarizing it in my own defense. So there are four problems in the moment, in this cultural moment, that I would identify as kind of the key concerns of people who are active in the mad space. And those four problems I've identified on the PowerPoint are naming and speaking for, where is everybody, citation ethics and lived experience context, and weaponized reductivism. And I will go through them really quickly for you. So naming and speaking for is basically the rhetoric of naming and who gets to name or name themselves or name others. And this will be familiar to anyone with a disability background because it's basically the same argument. We're just using different words. Mentally ill, mental disability, mentally disabled, neurodiverse, uh, psychosocial disability, disabled with the, uh, what's that called? With the backslash, uh, patient, survivor, client, Everybody gets offended by some of these names and not offended by others. If you're talking to someone in the MAD movement or MAD, you should just ask them what terms they prefer because everybody has a different answer to this. The ones I've bolded are the ones I identify the most with now, but I've found over the years that my dissonances toward the words change and morph, particularly how they're used in the public context. So. I don't like to say, my name is Sarah and I am mentally ill, because I think that's just rhetorically devoid. But there are other people in the MAD movement who refuse to use the term neurodiverse because they think it's that, that word is not making them comfortable, it's making other people comfortable. And that act of making you more comfortable with me is seen as offensive to me. And I think there's a lot of merit to that argument. There's also subsets of mental illnesses who don't feel that their illness is a mental illness. It's a literal ability, which is where you get the backslash from. And the most famous example of that is the autism crowd. They don't see autism as a mental illness. They call it very specifically a neurodiverse ability or a, a disabled with the slash because they see that as a different ability. But you have to be very careful who you're calling differently abled, which is just a retired word, don't use it whatsoever, 
and who you're calling neurodiverse and who you're calling mentally ill, right? So that's a whole problem. Uh, where is everybody? Because in pretty much all contexts, this was designed for the higher ed context, but even if you went to work, you went to the coffee shop, you went to a business meeting, dangerous disclosure conditions in these superstructures uh, create environments that are very oppressive to the mad movement. So you get people who say like, I've never met a schizophrenic, or you're so normal, I couldn't even tell that you were mentally ill. And that's, well, it's intended as a compliment, and thank you, I appreciate it. Um, it's also kind of a terrible thing to say, like when I repeat it back to you and you're like, oh, that was kind of a shitty compliment. Yeah, so I call that the mental illness safari, where you're kind of enjoying it from a distance and commenting on, like, how cool the animals are, but you never have to relativize possibly being one of those animals, you know, that's the mental illness safari. Citation ethics, a lot of this is patient porn and people writing about mentally ill people or doing research studies about mentally ill people, and they don't get cited, they don't get their lived experience credit, they don't get any kind of credit, typically, they don't get paid for that labor, there's, uh, there's a lot of that. And the, what I called weaponized reductivism, which is a bit harsh, but I think fair, um, wherein if you try particularly in policy arguments to say i think x illness class should be supported in the classroom you get these really hyperbolic counter arguments like i don't think it's safe to have harley quinn types in the classroom or in the business meeting or you know if you're american this discourse immediately goes to school shooters every time if we let mentally ill people in the classroom one of them is eventually going to kill us or harm us or come with a gun. And this kind of hyperbolic um, worst case scenario building, I called it weaponized reductivism because it depends on a definition of mental illness that doesn't account for people who are able to like string full sentences together or do research or get mad without pulling out a weapon, right? And that can be really harmful for people who are trying to live, you know, what we would call a normative lifestyle, but what is that? Um, when this kind of hyperbolic argumentation about you is taking place at the same time. So it creates this very dissonant space of people are afraid of me, but I would like the same rights and ethics and equity arguments as people that you're not afraid of. And that's really difficult. So if I flip back to what I made for you, a lot of that is what I already said. Overrepresentation of the biomedical model. All of you know that. That's in the news all the time. Uh, psychosomatism. That basically means it's all in your head. Um, obviously really offensive to people with mental illness. Mass consumption entertainment. So all the Mindhunter villains. If that's the first thing you think of when I tell you my diagnosis, that's harmful, right? Because there's a lot of unsaid rhetoric happening there where your frame of reference for schizophrenics is people who kill people. And even if you don't immediately associate that with me, the, the body, mind, the person, the, the strange little girl telling you about madness, um, there's still an argument happening internally right? Overrepresentation of trauma porn. So there's a lot of people who really like to write about, you know, the really ugly sides of their illness and people treat that literature like body horror or like a fun time in this safari sense where you can look and gaze at it, but you never actually have to, to rectify it in your own mind or render it as a possibility for yourself. That's problematic. Cure-based research, CAMH is really bad for that. CAMH is our, Canada's, mental health uh, major research center, and they will pretty much only publish in cure-based rhetorics, and it drives everybody crazy. Self-other policing, that's a whole thing. Dark academ and st superstructural academy dialectics. Basically what we were talking about with the hyperbolic arguments and presuming that excluding these people from your space 
therefore makes that space safer. And probably people who would come to a meeting like this don't believe that, but there are plenty of people who do believe that, and that's worth knowing. So before I, ha I throw it back to you one more time, I'm going to tell you a little bit about, okay, that was a whole lot of problems. I'm very overwhelmed. What are we actually doing about it? And my answer to that is restorative justice and um, cozy facilitation and mobilizing research and people and body minds who are able to change people's minds about the current dialectic. That's my answer. That's not everyone's answer. This is just the Sarah answer. So in restorative justice frameworks, it's really important to be able to name the harm, which is what we just spent 45 minutes doing. Well done, everybody. And creating these brave space environments to face these difficult questions, like shout out to the person who asked, you know, why is there a sub-debate about eating disorders? That's a tough question. If you ask that in some context, you know, I don't know that you wouldn't get yelled at. And I think that stops a lot of people from asking difficult or grace-based questions. And that's what makes facilitation and holding cozy space and saying, I will be here to answer what you want to know and hold those questions with the best possible intent. And if I love you by default, I hope that you're challenging yourself to walk down that pathway and ask more difficult things about mental illness or people with mental illness or the MAD movement more generally. Does that make sense? I'm talking to myself, but I hope that makes sense. So within that facilitated space, um, we have to give MAD's gang the ability to self-narrate the story, which in the academic context gets written about as self-empowered co-design, because we always have to make everything sound fancier than it is. And that's basically my ability to tell you my story or my research or my frameworks, independent of a researcher that says, hello, as an able-bodied person, um, I am here to translate Sarah, which is what we've been doing when you're, <laughs> when you're being kind of reductive about it, right? We have the unreliable narrator by default, and it's always mediated by someone who is more reliable, but that more reliable is based in very ableist ethics, right? My ability to construe my own thoughts and my story doesn't need to be mediated by a third party, um, maybe perhaps fact check. But then once we've done that fact check, I would hope that you would believe me on my own merit, as opposed to someone without mental illness, you know, assuring you that I'm not out of my mind, right? These movements are micro, not macro. So you've seen rallies about nothing about us without us kind of thing. That's uh, borrowed from the MAD movement. Having conversations about people who are using crazy derivatively. I don't think anyone says the word crazy with me anymore, which is really nice because I'm so tired of it. Drawing attention to really essentialist dialectics like school shooters are mentally ill, drawing that equation. No, like, you have to think a little harder than that. Uh, resisting policing others who want to exist in that space, opening gateways and doors for others, and this can sometimes even be physically. If you see someone in the midst of a panic attack, you know, learn what to do to have them calmed in safe space. There are courses for that. Holding safe listening spaces for your friends and allies. I, I term this on Twitter as asking, how are you really? Instead of saying, how are you? Because you're inviting them to actually share their context as opposed to being polite. Uh, and holding that gray space with yourself. So just having the wherewithal to think through some of your biases about mentally ill people. And that's really hard. I'm not saying you can now do this today. Congratulations. Um, those are all pathways and journeys that you start on and you get better at over time. So I guess what I'm saying 
is that all of these little instantiations are grassroots activist contacts. You don't have to stage a protest with signs to be active in the MAD movement, right? The other thing we'd like to see, creating more space for LSP research, that's lived experience, MAD allied voices, and self-authored works to enter the mental illness academic discourse. So that's what I was talking about before, about speaking with instead of speaking for or speaking on behalf of. There are not enough academic texts that are fully first person authored by people with mental illness. And we went over a ton of reasons for that, and that sucks. And we're working on more of those spaces where this LXP and these forms of expertise are better represented. A lot of that happens in the CDS community, uh, critical disability studies. I have a ton of resources for that if you want. If you work in a space where you can do this, adding advisory panels, committees, research assistants, uh, adding voices that can speak out against peer-based research initiatives. Um, these advisory panels, the problem now is that I'm on a ton of them, uh, including the Lancet. And my big problem with the advisory panel for the Lancet is that it's very performative. There's a group of us who have donated our time and resources and expertise. And essentially what happens is we want you to read this article and give us a bunch of feedback on it from your myriad perspectives. We issue a bunch of feedback and all the ways in which this study could be improved. And then they go, thank you. And then kind of put the paper in the recycling and proceed as promised. And I'm like, okay, like you technically have an advisory panel, but if you don't actually take any of the advice, why do we have the advisory panel, right? So I've been very outspoken about the Lancet advisory panel, but this is happening everywhere. We add all of these panels and boards and committees that are supposed to investigate this co-design framework. But when you're not honestly taking advantage of that co-design, what you're really doing is posturing or virtue signaling like you care about it, but you don't care about it. So if you're going to do it, do it correctly. So this is my last your turn as we come into the last 10 minutes. And we're going to talk, obviously, about community activism. So my slide says, can you commit to one small concrete step today that would start you on a pathway toward increasing your space making for MAD movement allies? And what might that look like? So I'm going to take it back to the Jamboard. I have flipped to page four. Um, and an example I'll give you is joining or reading the MAD movement Twitter community. And I can give you a bunch of resources for that. But one small example of something very achievable is I am going to commit an hour of my day on Friday to reading MAD voices from MAD Twitter. I think that would be really productive and generative for people who are trying to become familiar with this space, um, even if the arguments I don't love. I think the fact we're having those arguments in public space is what I love, and I think those can be really generative steps. And I would love if you guys, one more time, took the sticky note button and contributed one small thing that we could maybe think about or we could read or, you know, I'll say, um, I will purchase the book I am not familiar with that were mentioned today. And I really will. I'll do that. The books that you guys mentioned that I haven't read before, I would love to read those, especially if they're the first thing your mind goes to when you think of mental illness. That's something very concrete that I could do pretty easily, doesn't take up a ton of time, but that's showing up for people, right? And I think one of the keys to the MAD movement is how we show up, or if you showed up. And the way I like to show up 
is by holding talks and seminars about how to show up, um, of which this was a mini version. But there are easier ways to show up than throwing on seminars, right? So someone said, stop using the term mad or crazy. <laughs> it's true. Once, it's kind of one of those things where once you've seen it, you can't unsee it. And crazy is really bad in the North American context, you know, anytime something is completely not understandable, it's crazy. But if I'm also definitionally, I guess by diagnosis, crazy, we're kind of constantly implying that I am constantly not understandable. But you understood me today, right? So that can't be true. So maybe it's our use of crazy that actually isn't understandable, I guess would be my argument there. Mad, yeah, that's more the UK context. That doesn't get used a lot here, but it's the same argument, right? That's absolutely mad to say that's dumb or ununderstandable. And I don't think I'm dumb or ununderstandable. Maybe I'm a little ununderstandable. You can give me feedback about that. I will study some of the topics mentioned today and write about them for my blog. I love that. Even if you use your blog to just explore what you yourself think of that idea from where you are on your learning journey, I think that's super generative. And this would have been a completely different presentation from me three years ago than where I am today toward the end of my dissertation. And that's a really long journey, right? That's almost a thousand days of doing this every single day. Rewatch some of the films and identify and maybe write about ways in which they represent forms of mental distress in negative, inaccurate, or problematic ways. If we had people do this every single day, um, that would be fabulous. If we, if we even had, you know, I remember in my undergrad, there were activities and assignments from my undergrad where you would have to watch a movie and diagnose the characters. And that was really shitty looking back, right? Where we're just kind of out here armchair diagnosing characters with these pathological life altering conditions for the sake of an essay argument. Not sure I agree with that looking back. I would like to understand the difference. Oh, I lost it. Okay, hold on, there's a lot. Between Wellness versus tier-based research, yes. And I want to push up against my own inclination toward overcoming narratives. Yes, I didn't get into that much today, but the overcoming narrative is a particularly poisonous brand of mental health research where we valorize people who are essentially able to act as able as possible. So you could write an overcoming narrative about me getting a doctorate well schizophrenic. But what that story is really about is you didn't think I could do anything with that diagnosis. And despite your belief that I could do essentially nothing, I happen to do something kind of impressive anyway. When you render it like that, you know, the overcoming thing kind of takes on a more problematic dimension, right? And that's not to say never celebrate success. I think you should celebrate success, but I think you should celebrate success as if I am just as abled or more abled or comparative. And a lot of those overcoming narratives take for granted that I am not comparative to you in a realistic sense. Be critical of hierarchies in a therapeutic setting as a psychology student. Yes, co-design frameworks. People know a lot more than we give them credit for, particularly in psychology and psychiatry contexts. This kind of saviorism we apply to people who we think can't think for themselves is often not needed. Is there, some, is there anything I missed? I got that one. I got that one. Ask my new employer about how they involve LXP in their training. Yes, that's a great one. And their answer will be, we don't. And what you could suggest is an advisory board or a committee. That would be great. To engage more on Twitter, connections help me understand better. Love that. 
Would you be open to take some questions on your talk today? Yes, I can totally do that. Continue to be open about my experiences with depression, anxiety, and anorexia to increase understanding. Yes, if you are a holder of LXP, disclosure is a fraught subject, but if you feel comfortable with disclosure dialectics, I encourage you to put your stories out there and very critically interrogate with yourself whether you're writing an advocacy narrative or an overcoming narrative. And I encourage you to think a little more if you're going to write an overcoming narrative, because people will use that story against you, essentially. And I will wrap up by saying thank you to Yana and obviously the University of Lim Limerick for hosting a generative space. Thank you for sharing your lunch hour or wherever you are in the world with me. And I am honored and grateful that you chose to stay with me today. I have some contact information there if you'd like to speak to me directly. Uh, email is the worst way to reach me, but you can try. I'm trying to keep up. And I've given you some further interaction if you want to continue exploring Mad Movement Dialectics. I put Asylum Magazine, uh, the Neurodiverse Postgrads Collective. Uh, if you're in the UK, Tamar James runs a Mad Reading Group. It's awesome. Uh, Twitter account at Mad COVID does storytelling. Couple books: Mad at School, Margaret Price, The Collective Schizophrenias, Esme Wine. Mad Matters is a Canadian anthology by Brenda LaFrancois. Mad in America. That was Forrester. Oh geez, can't off the top of my head. Literatures of Madness was Elizabeth uh, Bowen. Connect with current ag activists. We are super active on Twitter and look into CES publications. And yeah, are there any particular chapters in Mad Matters that you would recommend for reading? Yes, definitely the introduction. And where's my, where's my coffee? Hold on. Okay. I've read this book about a hundred times. Um, G. and Lee's Mad as Hell is excellent. Um, Lanny Beckman's Democracy as a Radical Idea was excellent. And what was the other one I really liked? Okay, that's a, that's a very Canadian context one. But there's another one written by Kimberly White called The Making and Marketing of mental health literacy in Canada. And other people have written about this, but it's a very insidious framework of how we how we sell mental health research. And there's like a whole other talk we could do about that. That article's probably worth reading too. If Yana wants to come back on and do a question period, that's okay with me. Great. Great. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much. That was really, really, really interesting. interesting. Lovely. Lovely.